This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video focuses on the methods used in most clinical practices to assess neuromuscular function after the administration of neuromuscular blocking agents. Because these agents can be lethal, Clinicians should be familiar with the use of nerve stimulators and monitors to assess neuromuscular function. It is important to understand the principles of normal neuromuscular transmission when you are using neuromuscular blocking agents. The neuromuscular junction consists of the motor nerve terminus, the postsynaptic muscle end plate, and the intervening gap. An action potential reaching the motor nerve terminus triggers the release of acetylcholine from synaptic vesicles. Acetylcholine then rapidly diffuses across the gap to the postsynaptic end plate, where nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are clustered. These receptors convert the chemical signal into an electrical impulse, causing depolarization in the postsynaptic membrane. Excitation-contraction coupling immediately results in muscle contraction. The action of acetylcholine is terminated by dissociation from receptors and passive diffusion away from the end plate and by enzymatic degradation by acetylcholine esterase. There are two types of neuromuscular blocking agents, depolarizing and non-depolarizing. These are classified according to their mechanism of action. Succinylcholine is the only depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent that is currently in use. It mimics the action of acetylcholine at the nicotinic receptor, producing sustained depolarization of the muscle end plate, which causes fasciculations and subsequent flaccid paralysis. Spontaneous recovery typically occurs in 7 to 12 minutes. Non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents, such as vecuronium, bind competitively to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, blocking the ability of acetylcholine to produce depolarization and leading to flaccid paralysis. Neuromuscular blocking agents make a variety of life-saving procedures possible. However, these agents can be lethal unless appropriate ventilation is provided and the use of a peripheral nerve stimulator at a minimum or a monitor whenever possible to guide administration of blocking agents is recommended. Assessment of neuromuscular block during airway instrumentation can preclude complications such as failure to ventilate, airway trauma, regurgitation and aspiration, and optimizes intraoperative surgical conditions. Confirming the return of adequate neuromuscular function is also important prior to endotracheal extubation to ensure that the patient has adequate muscle strength and avoid hypoxemia. Thus, monitoring neuromuscular function before, during, and after the administration of neuromuscular blocking agents is vital to patient safety. Monitoring neuromuscular function involves stimulating a peripheral nerve and evaluating the contraction of the innervated muscle. Peripheral nerve stimulators are generally battery-operated, handheld units that produce various patterns of stimulation, either directly or through wires connected to electrodes on the skin. Neuromuscular monitors not only stimulate a nerve, but also measure the evoked muscle response. Nerve stimulators and the stimulation units of the neuromuscular monitors deliver currents at amplitudes ranging from 0 to 80 mA. The threshold current has the amplitude necessary to evoke a muscle contraction. The maximal current has the amplitude necessary to evoke contraction of all fibers in a muscle. The supramaximal current has an amplitude 30% greater than the amplitude of the maximal current to ensure consistent contraction of all fibers despite changes in resistance over time. The silver chloride interface of the electrode reduces skin resistance and enhances the delivery of the current to the nerve. To ensure that the nerve stimulator is functioning properly, check the battery and inspect the connections and integrity of the cables. To confirm electrical output, create a closed circuit and deliver a current while monitoring the amperage if the unit has a readout display. To ensure adequate electrode contact, Cleanse and abrade the skin. It may be necessary to increase the current in obese or edematous patients. When possible, monitor the adductor pollicis muscle. 
It is the only hand muscle of the Fenner eminence that is innervated solely by the ulnar nerve. Monitoring this muscle helps to ensure that the muscle contraction is generated by a nerve impulse rather than by direct muscle stimulation. To monitor the adductor pollicis muscle, place stimulating electrodes on the anterior surface of the forearm along the ulnar nerve. Place the distal negative electrode 2 cm proximal to the wrist crease and place the positive electrode along the ulnar nerve 3 to 4 cm proximal to the negative electrode. If it is not possible to monitor the adductor pollicis muscle, the flexor hallucis muscle can be used. In this case, place the electrodes posterior to the medial malleolus along the posterior tibial nerve to monitor plantar flexion of the big toe. Other muscles have been used for monitoring, but these muscles may not provide accurate responses. A common but problematic practice is to place the electrodes on the face to monitor the response of the orbicularis oculi or corrugator supercilii muscles of the eye. Improper placement of electrodes on the temple and lower jaw may lead to direct muscle stimulation and erroneous assessment of neuromuscular recovery, particularly if the responses are assessed visually. Erroneous assessment can increase the risk of postoperative residual paralysis. Nerve stimulators can deliver a variety of impulse patterns that can be used to assess the intensity of neuromuscular block, including single twitch, train of four, tetanic stimulation, post-tetanic count, and double burst stimulation. The single twitch is one supramaximal stimulus applied to a peripheral nerve while observing the evoked response. A supramaximal single twitch at a frequency of 0.1 Hz or 1 Hz can be used to determine the onset of action of a neuromuscular block. The single twitch is not helpful in determining adequacy of recovery. The train of four pattern consists of four sequential single twitch stimuli called T1, T2, T3, and T4, delivered at a frequency of 2 Hz. The train of four response ratio is calculated by dividing the T4 response amplitude by the T1 response amplitude. Calculate the train of four ratio before administering muscle relaxants and use this ratio as the control ratio. The ratio should be 1 or 100%. During a partial non depolarizing block, the ratio decreases or fades as the block increases. There is typically no fade with a depolarizing block. The amplitude of each twitch is constant but is diminished proportionally. There is a predictable relationship between the percentage of postsynaptic receptor occupancy and the fade of the train of four ratio that is caused by a non-depolarizing neuromuscular block. Up to 70% of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors can be blocked without any apparent decrease in the train of four ratio. As the neuromuscular block progressively increases, the train of four ratio progressively fades. All four twitches become undetectable after more than 95% of the receptors are blocked. Deliver a train of four sequence and assess the degree of fades objectively by visual or tactile means, or, when T4 disappears, by counting the number of responses, which is known as the train of four count. The train of four ratio remains consistent over a range of stimulating currents. This consistency at various stimulating currents allows this pattern to be used as a measure of neuromuscular recovery, because currents of 20 to 30 milliampers do not cause significant pain in most patients. In contrast, supramaximal currents of 60 to 70 milliampers can be painful. Double burst stimulation is delivered by administering two intense stimuli which are mini tetanic bursts 0.75 seconds apart. The two fused muscle responses can be evaluated as a direct comparison, similar to the train of four ratio. Because the two individual bursts are tetanic in frequency, a recovery period that is longer than the train of four recovery period of 20 seconds between bursts is necessary. As compared with the first burst, the second burst elicits a diminished response or fade during partial non depolarizing block. Clinicians are better able to detect residual block by visual and tactile means with the use of double burst stimulation than with the use of train of four stimulation. For more information regarding indications of each pattern of stimulation, see Figure 4 in the PRINCE supplement. Subjective evaluation of neuromuscular function may consist of feeling or seeing the response after stimulation. However, subjective assessments are not accurate. For instance, 
when the train of four ratio recovers to a value of 0.4 or higher, detection of train of four fade is not reliable. Subjective detection of fade during double burst stimulation or 100 Hz tetanic stimulation may approach the threshold of adequate recovery, but such evaluations are painful and should not be performed in conscious patients. Therefore, decisions that are based on subjective or qualitative evaluations are frequently incorrect. Clinical tests such as grip strength, leg lift, and head lift are similarly inaccurate detectors of residual fade, yet they continue to be used. These clinical tests do not require sufficient muscle function to allow for the identification of residual neuromuscular weakness. Although these tests cannot rule out residual block, they can provide useful information in settings where more accurate monitors are unavailable. Objective evaluation involves recording, processing, and measuring muscle responses to nerve stimulation. In the clinical setting, the tool used most frequently for the objective evaluation of neuromuscular function is acceleromyography. To perform acceleromyography, affix the accelerometer onto a moving digit, ideally the thumb, to measure acceleration in response to ulnar nerve stimulation. It is not difficult to set up an acceleromyography device. The thumb must be allowed to move freely, and there can be no movement of the hand or the arm, since any such movement may change the direction of thumb adduction or the baseline measurement, necessitating recalibration. Nerve stimulators are remarkably safe devices. However, complications can occur, including pain during neural stimulation, myalgias, nerve damage caused by pressure from the electrodes, and burns resulting from equipment malfunction. Nerve stimulators can also interfere with electrocardiographic monitoring and may cause an implanted pacemaker to malfunction. Monitoring neuromuscular function is recommended whenever neuromuscular blocking agents are used. Clinical or subjective assessment is unreliable. Routine nerve monitoring performed with objective measurement techniques provides additional safety with minimal risk to patients and helps to avoid potentially life-threatening complications.